Welcome to Vision Plus, a program featuring a positive outlook, dealing with everyday situations of marriage, children, and business. Believing Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Teacher, author, speaker, delighting audiences from... Well, hello and welcome. It's Vision Plus again, and we have with us Richard Sykes, and he's going to tell us more about his books that he's written. And I want to know about your writing the books. Let's first of all just recap some of the books. I've written a few. This is backstage. It's about uh, my friend that was the only woman ever hired by Hank Williams, Bernice Turner, and B.B. King and her were good friends. And Well, actually, Elvis used to come and watch her play. Then it has a lot of... It's, like, it's kind of like a picture book you would have on your coffee table with, uh, it has all so many pictures of B.B. King and Elvis Presley and uh, Johnny Cash and Loretta Lynn and a lot of things about that. And another book that this is uh, Mission Possible is an anthology, part of the National Speakers Association, and that's uh, got Kardashian's very own, um, well, I won't talk about him very much, Bruce Jenner, but he was an Olympic gold medalist. And uh, Tim Sanders was one of the chief solution officers for Yahoo. And then Jack Canfield, uh, he and uh, Victor Mark Hansen had started the Chicken Soup for the Soul in uh, I, I'm in one of their books too, also, uh, and uh, how how the Lord put our marriage back together. Almost got a divorce, so we have that one. Then our daughter Emily, who was a she was a Russian interpreter, and we wrote about her. She went to the former Soviet Union, and it took her and her group took a million Bibles to the former Soviet Union. So if you'd like to have, if you order one of her books, any of these you can have for $8 each. And then we will send you a, bit, a DVD of her singing uh, that she had done. She wrote a couple hundred songs, and so we have those. And then she passed, um, is with the Lord now. Also, the one book that I hadn't mentioned before was the influence of television on the communication between parent and child, parent and, child. and it is um, really an incredible research that we did with uh, 10,000 people. And so if you'd like to get that and read that, you may have it. Now I want you to meet, uh, meet again Richard Sykes. Hey, by the way, I knew a really, we had a really good friend in Jonesboro, Arkansas, named Fred Sykes. Mm -hmm. Very, 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 very well to do. So it, you could claim him. He sneaked across the border and got over in Arkansas uh -huh. and worked for the Colson Corporation, which is on the Pritchkers on the Hyde House uh, chain. And uh, they had that as one of their personal companies. My husband was chief engineer there. He's now the director of engineering at a company here in Huntsville. Uh, Richard is the author of, let's go over the books that you have written, that you have, and then I want to find out how you got started. Was it just the, yeah, okay? Right, La Laughing with the Bear was the first one, and this is 40 Funny Stories About Coach Bryant. has done really well. It's really a funny book. I've, I've got, every time I go out and do a book signing for any of my books, I, I run across a lot of people that say they've read Laughing with the Bear, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of really good feedback from that. Mm -hmm. And then after Laughing with the Bear, Laughing with the Bear came out in 2003, and in 2006 I came out with Laughing with the Head Ball Coach, which is a humorous look at Steve Spurrier, who is now the coach at South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And that has done really well with Florida and South Carolina fans. Then for basketball fans, I have Laughing with Uncle Adolph, came out in 2008, and this is 41 funny stories about Coach Adolph Rupp at Kentucky. And it has done really well with the Kentucky fan base. And then my latest creation, hot off the press in January of 2010, right after Alabama won the national championship by beating Texas, I 
published Alabama's Football Pride, the 13 National Championships. And I have a chapter about each team that won national titles. But my favorite of the 13 national championship teams that I have given speeches at over 30 civic clubs around the state is the 1925 team, which was Alabama's first national championship team. Mm -hmm. And that team really made football popular in the South. The South had been beaten down. Really, the South was in a depression from the time of the, after the Civil War Reconstruction until World War II started. We had a few years that the economy perked up a little bit, mainly in World War I, when we were feeding the, the world while the Europeans were killing each other. But generally, the South was in a depression for that whole time frame. And we were really looked down upon by people up north. And in 1925, Washington had a really good football team, the Washington Huskies. And nobody wanted to play them in the Rose Bowl. Everybody was afraid of them. And, and the Rose Bowl committee went around to three or four teams up north, and nobody wanted anything to do with Washington that year. And they had never invited a southern team to go to the Rose Bowl. And besides, Alabama had been undefeated that year, and so had Tulane. And they, the Rose Bowl committee invited Tulane to go to the Rose Bowl. But they didn't want anything to do with Washington either, so they turned it down. Now, at that point, word got out on the street that the Rose Bowl was going to ask Alabama to go out and, and play in the Rose Bowl. But there was a little bit of a problem in that the University of Alabama had a rule that said the football team couldn't play any postseason games. Now, Dr. George Denny was the president of the university at that time, and Dr. Denny was no academic who had his head in an ivory tower. He was a very practical man. Mm -hmm. And so he quickly had that rule repealed. All to, right. To, 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 to kept, them, kept them from going to a bowl game. Uh -huh. And so that they went out to Pasadena to play this much feared Washington team. Now, most football experts said, well, Alabama's going to lose by 40, 50, 60 points. And they were, it was just In like, football. It, it, it was just, they were going to be the laughing stock of the country. Now, back then, Will Rogers had a national radio show. Mm -hmm. And oh, well, I loved him. I always thought he was uh, related to me because in our my mother's bedroom, she had a picture up on the wall. Of I, 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 I love him. He's saying, I never met oh, yeah. a man I didn't like. Yeah, that's right. A, 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 a lot of people said that, uh, that uh, Will Rogers never met Steve Spurrier. <laughs> <laughs> But, but you found Steve Furrier to be I, very nice. I, I found him that I could definitely like him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, getting back to Will Rogers on his national radio show, just before the Rose Bowl that year, he said, well, you know, the University of Alabama is located in a place called Tuscaloosa. <laughs> so he didn't, <laughs> he, he didn't give them much of a chance either. <laughs> oh, and, my. And Washington had, had a a really good player. They had a lot of really good players that year, but they had one guy who was a dominant uh, running back, George Wildcat Wilson. Wilson was about 6'2 and weighed about 220 pounds, which was really big for that time. And not only was he big, but he was really fast, a shifty runner. And they didn't have a Heisman Trophy back in 1925, but if they had, Wildcat Wilson would have been the odds-on favorite to have won the Heisman Trophy that year. Now, when the game started, Alabama was playing like they were just glad to be there, that it was a big honor for them, and they weren't really playing with much emotion. And in the first quarter, Washington scored one touchdown, went up six to nothing. Second quarter, Washington scored another touchdown. Now, who was the coach at that? Oh, it was Bear Bryant the coach? Uh, no, no. Uh, that was that been. Wallace Wade. Oh, okay. Wallace, Wallace Wade. Wade put Alabama football on the map. So, a uh, couple of touchdowns behind, 12 to nothing in the middle of the second quarter. Now, at that time, right in the middle of the second quarter, there was an inconsequential play that really changed the history of the South forever. One of Alabama's star players was a guy who later became a cowboy movie star, Johnny Mac Brown. Uh -huh. 
Oh my goodness. And he, he was an out he was an all American running back. Mm -hmm. And Johnny Mac Brown ran for a couple of yards and he was tackled by Wildcat Wilson. Now that doesn't seem like much of a play that's gonna change history. But after the play was over, when Johnny Mac Brown started to get back to his feet, Wildcat Wilson reached over and grabbed his ankle and gave his foot a good twist. Uh oh. And so horrible. Alabama had been playing without much emotion to that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. And that just enraged them. Oh yeah. And plus Alabama's quarterback was a guy named Pooley Hubert. And Pooley was like a coach on the field. He, he was a good bit older than the rest of the team. He was 25 years old at that time. Most of the players were 21, 22 years old. And that uh, Wildcat Wilson twist of Johnny Mac Brown's ankle enraged old Pooley. And he called time out and told the rest of the Alabama players that nobody had been playing much defense all day. He'd been playing all the defense. And if they wound up losing to Washington after Wildcat Wilson had had that cheap shot against Johnny Mac Brown, he was going to take care of the team himself after the end of the game. And they knew Pooley wasn't, wasn't uh, pulling any punches. So that, that got Alabama fired up. They didn't score any in the rest of the uh, second quarter, but they did play a lot better. But they went into the to the dressing room at halftime down 12 to nothing. Now Wallace Wade was a man of few words. And he didn't have much to say at halftime. Basically all he said was that I always thought boys from the South would fight. And then he left the dressing room after he, he said that. And he turned the rest of the halftime over to Pooley, mm -hmm. who made more threats against the, his teammates if they didn't help him beat Washington. And so in the in the third quarter, Alabama got the ball on about the 45-yard line of Washington, and Pooley just started like a madman, just running straight up the middle. And it only took him about four runs to get into the end zone. And that cut the lead from 12 to nothing to 12 to seven after Alabama converted their point after touchdown. And so then people in the stands were thinking, well, you know, these Alabama boys, they've come a long way, and they're not going to be so disappointed on the trip back home. They at least scored a touchdown, and they won't be completely embarrassed by this. And so then Alabama kicked off to Washington. Washington, Alabama's defense was still fired up, and so Washington could do absolutely nothing with the ball. And they kicked back to Alabama. Alabama ran a couple of plays, and then they threw a 65-yard bomb to Johnny Mac Brown. Uh oh. And nobody could catch him. He's in the end zone. Alabama kicks the point after touchdown and it's 14 to 12 Alabama. And now people up in the stands, they're, they're thinking that, you know, I don't, I don't believe what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. Not only are they not going to be embarrassed, but they, they might have some chance of winning this ball game. Now, after that, Alabama kicked off again to Washington. Washington fumbled on the first play and Alabama had the ball on Washington's 30-yard line. First pass, first play was a pass to Johnny Mac Brown on about the two-yard line, and he dragged the tackler into the end zone. <laughs> and now it's 20 to 12, Alabama. In the space of about six minutes, the game had completely changed from Alabama being hopelessly out of it to looking like they were going to win the game. Now, after uh, John, after Wildcat Wilson had tackled. Johnny Mac Brown and, and did the cheap shot in the second quarter. Alabama's defense was so enraged they they tackled Wilson so hard on the first play after that that they knocked him out of the game and he, they knocked him silly. And so he was out of the game for the rest of the second quarter and all of the third quarter. Alabama built up their lead 20 to 12. Now at the end of the third quarter, Wildcat Wilson regained his senses to some degree and he came back in the game and he led Washington to one final touchdown where they cut the, the final uh, margin of defeat to 20 to 19. But Alabama Alabama, Alabama won by one point. Woo! But there was pandemonium throughout the South. Not, not just, and that, of course they had parades as soon as they, they were getting the word back through the telegraph. And this was even before the games were on radio. And they were getting the news back through telegraph and they would have parades in Montgomery. Birmingham, Mobile, and all of the, even the small towns would have a little parade around the courthouse so Tuscaloosa square. Tuscaloosa was and, no and, longer a loser. And Tuscaloosa was not a loser at, anymore. 
And not only did the state of Alabama get fired up over the win, but the whole South did. There, there were a lot of people in the South who had never heard the word Yankees used as a single word. It had always had a word that preceded it. Yeah, <laughs> we know what that and is. And on TV, we won't we won't go into that. <laughs> but but most people might start with the D. <laughs> but, but most people up north thought of most Southerners as a bunch of uh, illiterate hillbillies, sharecroppers, and whatever, and and not very bright. Mm -hmm. But the Southerners said, "Well, we have finally beaten this unbeatable Washington football team. We, we put these people in their place." Mm -hmm. And all over the South, not just in Alabama, it was a tremendous outpouring of emotion for the Alabama football team. And the newspapers in, in uh, Richmond, Atlanta, Memphis, they had headlines, not, not on the front page of the sports section, but on the front page of the newspapers, big banner headlines, the South has risen again, biggest victory since Appomattox. And, and we know now that Football dominates the South, and, and the South dominates football. Mm -hmm. That they've had the BCS championship 13 years, and SEC teams alone have won six of the championships, including the last uh, three or the last two have been here in the state of Alabama itself. Mm -hmm. So that all started though on that Rose Bowl in that Rose Bowl. January the 1st, 1926, in Pasadena, California. And you and I were kind of young at the time. I, I, I was <laughs> real young. <laughs> Gleam in our mother's eyes. Well, I know my brother, now, uh, you, you have to forgive me, but there's a few of us in the state. My brother play, played, uh, got a full scholarship, played for the Razorbacks, when Lou Holtz was there. And he has a few stories, too about how they did pretty well for it. I remember one day, now this was a, a day that Razorbacks played Auburn, oh, a few years ago, and the Razorbacks won. And the preacher wouldn't come up to the front of the stage. And he was that Auburn guy and he kept saying, kept, the, they kept singing and singing. Finally somebody just said out loud, the song leader did, uh, are you going to come up and preach? He said, I'm back here recruiting some players for Auburn. But I said, now my brother, I said to him, now my brother played for the Razorbacks. Can I stay in church or do I have to leave? You know, so it's fun though how people uh, live. And now the, if you think of the South, there's uh, Walmart, Sam Walton came from there, Dillard's, uh, it can't be yogurt. Uh, Tyson Foods, there's so many different companies that came from the South that have made work, that are global now. So that's a good thing. Well, I wanted to ask you about your writing your books. Uh, when do you write? Do you have a certain time you write, like in the morning or? Just when I'm not doing chores around the house. Uh -huh. but, uh, no, I, I spent a lot of time at the uh, library at the mm -hmm. Huntsville Library when I was doing the uh, research on the uh, Alabama's Football Pride book. And mm -hmm. then I would come home at night after being down there all day and, and, and start writing up the stories. Of course, I'm, I think most writers, if I write a story up and I go back and, and proofread it the next day, I change half the words in it. Mm -hmm. And I could go back the next day and look at it and I change half the words That's again. Right. And, 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 and you never are satisfied. No. But uh, Mainly, I, I go down and, and spend the daylight hours at the library, and, and then I come back and write at night while it's still fresh well, in my mind. when you're uh, doing the library work, do you do anything on your computer at that time, or are you doing yeah, or you, taking notes? Now, or? now, a lot of times, it's amazing how much stuff there is out on the internet. Yes. And, and there were several uh, Spurrier stories that I never had heard of. Mm -hmm. until I started looking on the internet and, and those were the ones that there were snippets of information about them on the internet but Spurrier when I when I wrote to him he, he filled in the details uh -huh. and, and really fleshed them out a lot but yeah it, it, it's amazing how much stuff you can find if you'll just take and you got another keywords too to, to put in to Google 
to, to really get the information you're looking for. Yeah. Well, now, you had uh, Mike Toll in Nashville to uh, more or less encourage you and do some of the, the, the things. He would kind of flesh it up, too, I guess, a little bit. Or do yeah, he, he, he's my editor, and he would, as Mike says, though, I'm paying him and I'm the, the ultimate boss. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Mike Mike has some good suggestions. Now what it? about the, the, you never got an agent over all of this? No, I'm, I am my own agent. All right, that's that, a that's, good thing. That, that, that's that a, way you keep 100% of your money instead of getting 15% out to the agent and then they sell it through Amazon, you end up with a nickel. Yeah, the, the, the thing about self-publishing is that, you know, as Bonnie said, you get all the money. Uh-huh. But and and now the, they if, don't call it self-publishing, it's independence. Independent, so. yes. Yeah. But uh, if you don't, if the books don't sell, which I haven't had that problem yet, but yeah. you, you never know about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But if they don't sell, then you wind up with a bunch of books in your garage, which mm -hmm. is which is not a good thing. No, and so what? Uh, so you go to the library, and you take your notes, and you look up, do the research, come home, and put them in the computer now. Yes, and I, I put them all on Microsoft Word, and then I just send the Microsoft Word up to Mike Toll, and, and as I say, he makes a book out of it. Mm -hmm. That's great. But, it, but he, he's really done a good job, and, and I have a lady in Nashville, too, who, who does my covers. Oh. And, and when, you sell, when you're in, an independent operator, yeah. you need a good eye-catching cover yes, to, to get people's mm -hmm. attention. And, and I have been very lucky with uh, Judy. Blessed. That, that has really does done. Does she work uh, with uh, Mike? They, 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 they know each other, and I think Mike had used her a lot when, when he was uh, in the publishing business, too, because Mike has gotten out of the publishing business, too, and now he, he's piddling up with the uh, Nashville, uh, with the Tennessean newspaper. Oh, okay. But he, he just, now he just does my publishing work as a, mm -hmm. as a sideline mm -hmm. venture. Mm -hmm. But, but he, he really puts out a great product, and, and that's, I think that's really helped So me. who actually prints them? I used to use... Maple Vale Publishing, and the name of the of the printer escapes me right now, Bonnie. But if, if anybody's interested, if they'll send me an email, I, I'd be glad to, to dig it out. But but uh, Maple Vale. Were since, they out of uh, Nashville? No, that they're they're way up north. They're up in upstate New York. Oh, okay, they're one of those. Yeah. D Yankees. Huh? And, 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 and I got one, uh, the one I use now is out of North Carolina, so they're a lot more convenient for sure. me. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, th what are you working on next? Does, do you have a, another idea that you want to work on? Yeah, I'm, I am about halfway into researching a book, another humor book about a football coach, Frank Howard, uh -huh. who, who was one of Coach Bryant's teammates at Alabama. Mm -hmm. And he was the, the coach at Clemson for um, almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was for 30 years. But another really colorful character. He was, he, he called himself the Bashful Baron of Barlow Bend. He, he was, he was from Alabama. Bashful Baron of Barlow, Barlow Bend. Bend. And he, he was, Barlow Bend, according to Frank, Barlow Bend is three axle greasings from Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and he, he was a really successful and, and a colorful coach at Clemson for 30 years. And I, I think the book will do really well. There's one really funny story in the Bryant book mm -hmm. about Coach Bryant and, and uh, Frank Howard. Co coach Bryant used to weigh his football players when they came in on campus for the first time when they were freshmen. Mm -hmm. And that was the weight and the height he put in the programs mm -hmm. through four years. Mm -hmm. Now, Coach Bryant knew that players might gain some weight, get bigger and stronger after eating at the training table and working out with weights for four years. But, but Coach Bryant thought if the opposing coach wanted to find out how big his players was, they could put their own effort into that. He wasn't going to hand it to them on a piece of paper. <laughs> and, and, and so one year when, when Frank Howard had his Clemson team play in Alabama. Howard made a big to do about it. he couldn't believe you couldn't believe anything that the bear said. He lied about how big his players were. He he underestimated all of that completely. 
And so after about two or three newspaper stories came out like that, Coach Bryant decided to get his goat. And so he, he had some scales rigged up uh -huh. where they would weigh about 50 pounds less than they actually <laughs> should have. And, and, and so he, he sent for Howard to come over to his office and he said, I'm sick and tired of all this griping you're doing about my player weights and I want you to see how we, we weigh these guys. Mm -hmm. And here's the scales that we weigh them on. And of course, Frank Howard weighed about 270 pounds then. So he showed 220. So, so he, got up, he got up on the scales and the scale said 220. And Frank looked at those scales and he said, Bear, I owe you an apology. There's nothing wrong with your scales. <laughs> <laughs> but, but how were there stories that may be something wrong with their scale. You know what I liked about everyone, of course, I, Lou Holtz, I knew better than Yeah, it, it, it was quite a character. Yeah, it was. Uh, but every one of them had integrity. Yes. They, they were believers. They believed in our country. Yes. And they believed in, most of them believed, were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were... They were not afraid to pray before those games, and I saw that side of their their lives that they were such a good influence on our young people. Yeah, yeah they, that, that, they molded a lot of a did. lot of uh, great characters down through the years. They yeah. did. They were. Now I did hear this one story about when Bear Bryant had was over in. They were going to uh, when they first start out with the group of uh, new players and they're uh, at the, what do they call it, a training camp or something in the very beginning and that one of the guys that was the best player uh, was not obeying the rules like he'd stay out too late or he wouldn't come in at the time. Probably Namath, was that Namath? Yeah, and, and he made him leave. Yeah, and he so didn't get to play, the, he kicked him off the team. Off the team yeah. Now that's the integrity to me. Integrity to me. Yeah, yeah he, that, he kicked him off just before the bowl game. I know year. it. And that was so yeah. unbelievable. And they won anyway, didn't they? Yes, yeah. they did. They and oh boy, don't this. you know that hurt yeah. him, his feelings to think, oh man, they didn't even miss me. And I'm the best player. <laughs> That's a, that was a good thing that I saw that side of their story. And, and so many people, uh, one of the people that had worked with him was Dee Powell, who was a coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there. I remember that name. Yeah, yeah. He, he played at uh, Texas A&M with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he did. And he had that integrity that, uh, that I saw in most of the coaches that you mentioned, even though some of them had a little high temper that they had. <laughs> but that's it. That's part of it. I thought the say you Southerners were fighters, and they were. So that was a good thing. Well, I can hardly wait till your next book comes out. And I'm afraid uh, that I'm going to be broke having to buy these books. But anyway, uh, I have uh, uh, the fans. Now, I also have a lot of Auburn fans, too. And they... Uh, they uh, are terrified when it's time for Albert and Alabama to play, but so far they're doing good. Also, with, you know, with the wins they've had so far. And uh, now I didn't really like uh, Penn State getting romped on that bad because my husband graduated Penn State one day when uh, in the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, the Penn State was playing Baylor. Now I went to Baylor. From Waco and um, the Baylor and Penn State. Now we were with all of these Baylor people, and our son knew his daddy graduated Penn State, so he's yelling for Penn State. I looked at Emily, our daughter, and I said, "Who's that kid over there? <laughs> Penn State kid, uh, mixed up with all the rest of us." So you have to, you know, if you take a little bit of joy like you've done, finding the laughter, that they had a humorous side to them, and they bring joy to the masses by the games, and it's so incredibly wonderful. And I hate it when they do uh, stupid things, you know, going out and drinking too much.